We have been spending some time in a very significant historic event that happened 500 years ago. The Protestant Reformation touched the future of Christianity in a very significant way. And you and I are living in the good of that. And you and I draw our thoughts back to the scriptures because in 1517, uh, around that time, others as well, uh, beyond Martin Luther, felt like Christianity lives and dies on accurately understanding what the Bible has said. And that conviction can't depart from us today. And so 500 years ago, we, we visited Martin Luther's moment in 1517 where he nailed 95 ideas, thoughts, truths to the door of a church for the sake of having a conversation to say, have not we drifted from these things? Do we still believe these things are what the scriptures have taught us? But what I want to do for us today is I, I want to explore, and we're going to do this the next few weeks, I want to explore what took place throughout the history of Christianity after the Reformation. When this Reformation occurred, there was this ripple effect that comes all the way down to us today. And we're going to look at one, a different dimension of that next week and then one more dimension of that uh, the week after that. But I, I want us to make this personal today. I want us to, to make sure that we're not studying history as though it's only history. And we're not looking back at an event that took place a long, long time ago with this idea of, well, that was good for them. What has that got to do with us? Well, here's what it has to do with us. At some point, every one of us in this room will or have had this experience. At some point, the gospel, whatever it is that we understand Christianity to be, it's going to find your life. It's, it's going to get in the same room with you and, and it's going to have a conversation with you. And at that point, it's going to interact with some things that are there inside of you. At whatever level they are, everybody's got, you got some beliefs that are in you. You've got some ways of doing life. You've got some ways of doing religion. You've got a philosophy of life about what really matters and what are the priorities and how do I orient my world. You have all that stuff in you. You, you own these ideas. You're, you're going to do something tomorrow based on that. And the gospel comes near to you. And it opens up a conversation with you and your life. Now listen, you can be 6 years old, 10 years old, 30 years old, 75 years old. But when the gospel comes near to you, it, it has a dialogue with you. If you will, it, it pulls out some ideas and it nails them on the forehead of your life. And says, what you think about these? And in a way, and I want to make this case strong to us, in a way, the gospel comes and the first thing it does is it protests you. Well, we started this series asking the question, would you protest? And that's, that's the challenge to each of us as Christians to see, do you own any convictions that you would die for? Is there some non-negotiable ideas in the, in the truths of God's word that these things are true and nothing else can be true in their place? Would you protest? Is there anything you believe about Christianity that you would say, you know what, I stand for these things. And anything apart from this is wrong. Would you protest? Well, now I want to ask you the question, have you been protested? You. Have you received a protest? Has the gospel come to you and made a declaration? Has it, has it conversed with you in a way that's made you feel as though you're not right? Your life's not right. What you believe isn't right. I remember I defined protest in the first week we started this. It, to, protest means to express strong disapproval. Of, or a disagreement with something. And when the gospel comes to us, listen, it does not come to human beings and find human beings are in the right place with God. If it did, then it would come and not have a disagreement with you. It would come put its arms around you and say, hey, bud, pal, you and I, we're together in this. But when the gospel comes to me, when it comes to me, it says, Keith, you got some problems, man. 
you have a you have a major problem in connection with God. So this subject of protests, let's make it personal. Not just was there a protest by some monk in Wittenberg, Germany, 500 years ago, but has the gospel protested you? And are you okay with that? Well, that's what we're going to explore today. I put this in your outline. To believe the Christian gospel, everyone must become a a self-protester, if you will. At some point, you've got to come to grips with, I know that I'm not okay. And you've got to protest yourself in some way. You must come to recognize that your condition and belief was out of step with God's revealed purpose. So to have a biblical story of the gospel is to have, listen carefully, beliefs that you have rejected and beliefs that you have embraced. All right, now don't go, any, don't go past that thought for a second. If you are standing here today and you have any confidence and any thought that you really are a Christian, you really do belong to God, and you really are saved, then you should be able to put your hands on beliefs that you have rejected and beliefs that you have embraced. That's why the nature of this protest element is so important. Because it forces us into evaluating our beliefs and not treating them like they're neutral or they don't matter. They matter. And we need to be able to look at our own lives. So right now, kind of survey your own life. Are there, are there beliefs that at some point you came to reject them? Because you came to accept something else that contradicted them. That should be the story of every Christian. It it is my story. Let me me share my story from the perspective of the Reformation and what we've experienced in in studying through the Reformation. I grew up in a family that was in a religious setting. So I don't have any remembrance of starting anything. It just was, it, it always was. We were always in a religious setting. The, the pattern of my life, <clears throat> uh, I was baptized as an infant. And, and then my earliest recollections of doing anything in the realm of religion was learning the practices, the concepts, the catechism, if you will, of a belief system. And, you know, I learned bits and pieces and details and, and practices and began to get absorbed in the routines of those practices. Now, I'm going to tell you my story. This may not be your story, but it may be your story. At some point, those details and what they particularly meant, they, that wasn't really alive for me. But I was practicing them because it was just what you did. At some point, though, religious component of life just had this basic good and bad element to it. And it was associated with the things that were in the Bible, associated with things and beliefs about God and, and Jesus Christ and his story. But when it came down to live in life, it was, it was quite a bit just about me doing good versus doing bad. You know, being, try to be a good person. Try to find some territory that's acceptable and live in that space and don't go outside those lines. But you know, Like most of us, I I was kind of self-generating the boundaries for that. So there was some stuff I definitely wasn't going to do. Definitely that was wrong. And you know, if I did something wrong, as I got older, the the boundaries spread out. I don't know if yours did that. You know, so when I was younger, you know, there was was these really narrow boundaries and just a lot of stuff you weren't supposed to do. And I, you know, was taught that if I did something bad, if I got outside of the good, then, then I needed to go to confession. Right? We learned about that in the Reformation. And I needed to do penance. And I needed to continue in the practices of my religion. So that was a routine, right? Try to live within these borders. And if you, if you get outside of that, go to confession, do penance, and then, and then stick with the routines and try and live within these borders. So that, that became my understanding of faith and of religion. And all the way up through the time when I, in eighth grade, I, I went through the, the traditions of my family, took the next step in that, and I was confirmed in eighth grade, as, as many of you probably were as well. But there was this massive disconnect between the realities of what I was saying on the outside and who I really was on the inside. 
Because the, the older I got, the more my own will and my own desires kicked in. And my own creativity about life. And so the borders began to change. And I didn't always identify sin the same way God did. And I began to practice things that were, you know, that I wouldn't have practiced earlier in life, but I was practicing them now. And yet still thinking, I'm all right with God. Me and God are cool. But I was a deceiver, an exaggerator, a user, destroyer of people's properties and personal elements in their life without much regard. Looking for thrills, trying to find the next adventure. If it could be, you know, I was, I was eighth grade, you know. Starting to smoke pot and drink and just do anything that could just create some entertainment. So self-entertainment, self-fulfillment, that was a big important thing to me. I wasn't quite this bad, but you know, some of you guys might remember if you watched the Godfather movies back in the 70s and 80s. There was this one particular scene that after I got saved, this, this scene came to life for me. The scene of, of Michael Carleone, the Godfather, you know, the, the next generation of Godfather. He's, he's going to church one day and he's having his child baptized. And he's standing there, but he just happens to be on that same day. He has arranged for his hitmen to wipe out all the mafia bosses in town. And so the scene is a shot of him in church and then some guy getting shot. And then a shot of him in church and some guy getting blown up. And, a shot him. and, and so there's this incongruity that that was my life. Now, I wasn't Michael Carleone. I was just, you know, some kid from <laughs> River Ridge. But I had my version of life that I could go to church and observe practices and then go live a life that didn't look like it fit with that. It didn't look like there was this moral, connected, affectionate relationship with God going on. Because there wasn't. You know, one of the things that was radically absent from my life, and I want to hold this out to you as a self-test to you, because real salvation, when God comes and draws near to you, salvation is, and from a biblical standpoint, salvation is more about what God does in you than what you do for you. Now, what God does in you is going to manifest itself in what you will do, but I knew a lot about what I was supposed to do. I had this religion that called on me to create borders and live a life a certain way. I didn't have a knowledge of the idea that God comes and does something to give life to us that radically transforms who we're ever going to be in the future. That event is the beginning of this salvation experience. I didn't know anything about that. If you had bumped into me as a young person... You would have not known me to be a person who loved God. I mean, loved God. You would not have bumped into someone who had affection for God. There was, there was this sense of emotional, full-orbed expression of devotion and, and love for God. That was not present in me. Matter of fact, I didn't notice it in people. Worship of God. Worship of God. Supreme value. Shove everything else aside. Be willing to part with things. Be willing to have your life turned upside down and changed because you value God. He, he is the treasure buried in the field. He is the pearl of great price. I didn't know anything of that. Even though I said I believed in God. God was not treasured by me that way. And then another thing that you would have never noticed in my life, I had no concern about the Great Commission. Zero. None. The idea that I, as a follower of Christ, have this mandate on my life to take the gospel to every living creature possible and to express the gospel to them, to call them to repentance and faith in this gospel. By the way, that's the assignment of every Christian. Not just some specialist, not TV evangelist. Every Christian is called with the mandate that if God leaves us here for one more day, that should possess us. It should inform what am I going to be doing tomorrow. Well, I should be strategically living my life for the sake of going into all the world and preaching the gospel. But if you had met me before my conversion, you would have seen nothing of that. 
I had never told anybody a thing about God and never thought I needed to. The thought never occurred to me. Engage people in their beliefs and, and form some kind of protest that, hey, you ever thought about maybe you're believing the wrong thing? Maybe you need to believe that? I would have never intruded in anybody's world with that kind of news. Because I didn't know anything about that. But I was religious. I had a category of religion and I was trying to live within some kind of boundaries. But when the gospel comes to that kind of a life, it, it protests that life. Right? Yeah. right? Let's look at some protesting verses here. Turn to 2 Corinthians with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All right, so before my conversion, these verses would have, they would have protested me. They would have spoke of things, they would have got in the room with me, and they would have had a conversation, and they would have said, Keith, this ain't you, is it? Right, so I would have been on the, if you will, the negative feeling end of these verses. These are not feel-good verses, these were foreign verses to me. 2 Corinthians 5, and you can pick the Bible up almost anywhere and, and do this. Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ controls us. And that word could also be translated compels us. It, it is this inner impulse, this strong affection that makes you do stuff. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. But for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If you meet Keith Collins in 1978, I don't know anything about this verse. It's a totally foreign concept. So if this verse gets in the room with me and has a conversation with me and says, hey Keith, I'm the gospel. Nice to meet you. And begins to talk to me about a love that compels and controls from the inside. That reshapes why you do what you do. No, 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 no. Don't misunderstand, Keith. I, I wasn't talking about some external pressure, expectations from your family and your friends. Or the little society that you're a part of that you call church. I wasn't talking about that. I'm talking about an internal atom bomb going off on the inside of you that, that you have to respond to. That there's this love inside of you that compels you. It, it will compel you to go to the ends of the earth for the sake of the gospel of Christ because you love that kind of way. I would have said, I have no idea what you're talking about. Really? Keith, that's, that's a shame. You sure you believe the gospel? This would have been an awkward exchange between me and the gospel. This idea that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. This idea that at some point you went from being an old existent creature to something new, something different. You're not that anymore. You're something different. And the gospel comes up and has that conversation with me in 1978. I have no idea what you're talking about. But in 1979 I do. But before, it was protesting me. It was saying, Keith, you're, you got an issue, man. You lack something. You have not received something you really, really need to receive. Verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Not counting their trespasses against them. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. No idea what you're talking about. I'm not an ambassador for anything. Except for me. 
my favorite football team, some rock group I'm a fan of, some lifestyle that I like, clothing line that I wear. I can talk about all those things. I can represent all those things. I hope they go to the ends of the earth and you wear the same clothes that I think are the ultimate cool clothes too. I could talk to you about that. I knew nothing of being an ambassador for Christ. Keith, do you know anything about representing the gospel to other people in this world? No. All right, see, these words come to me and, and they find me at odds with them. I'm at odds with these. I am not living this way. This is, does not describe me. It puts me in peril first. It makes me uncomfortable. You're talking about something that I don't possess. And you make it sound like I should. And yet I don't. This is what it's like to be protested. That's why I'm asking you the question today. Have you been protested? Have you found yourself in the place where the gospel comes to you and you recognize that ain't me? That's not my condition. That's not how I feel. You're not describing what's going on on the inside of me. Listen, you can be raised in this church. And this applies to you. And you're sitting here right now and you're saying, you know what? I ain't an ambassador for anything either. I got no sense of burden. The love of God doesn't compel me. I just want to stay out of trouble. I don't want the car to be taken away from me or whatever. You have all kinds of stuff motivating you to act like a Christian. You don't want your family to reject you. Right? You want to stay in line. You want to, you know, your family's got borders and boundaries. You got to behave a certain way. And if you want them to smile at you when you walk in the door, you got to live within these boundaries. That's, got, that's not the love of Christ compelling you. That's self-preservation. I just want certain people to be okay with me. And you, you, you church people just happen to be those people. That's not the love of Christ compelling you. You might not even be saved. All right, this could be protesting you. Not just because you come from one of those churches. You could be in this church and this is protesting you. Listen, when I... In, in, in your condition, I think I wrote this down in your outline, does your story, your story, does it feature conversion and regeneration? This being born again by the Holy Spirit or merely moral principles and religious practices? I right, think for a moment. Does your story feature conversion and regeneration a new life has dawned the spirit of God has taken up a new place in you and has brought you to life in a way that you weren't before and now you are alive or does your story feature moral principles and religious practices right that's what you do right your salvation story is about what you do not about what God did in saving you, but about what you do. If you had met me in 1978, my story featured moral principles and religious practices. And that's what I would have talked to you about. I would have talked to you about going to church, going to mass. I would have talked to you about how important the Eucharist is. Not fully understanding why it was important, just having been taught that there's something here that's unique and it's important and I would have just told you it's unique and it's important this is quite different than 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 the impact of salvation coming to us and bringing new life to us but I want you to catch this you have to be okay with the fact that the, the gospel comes to you first in protest. Because if you don't get that, then you, you just think that the gospel comes to you as a cheering mechanism. It, you're already all right with God. You just need God to come alongside and cheer you on a little bit. That's not how the gospel comes to us. Right? I mean, I'm going to introduce you to something. We're just going to race through the gospel of John here for a moment. To get introduced that the, the gospel doesn't come to us to approbate us first. It comes to us first to protest us. And if you don't get that, you might not really be a Christian. It's that important. 
All right, turn, turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. Long before Martin Luther was trying to find some nails, nailing a message up on a board, the ultimate protester had already come. Jesus, the ultimate protester, had shown up. And I want to be careful in saying this because I know I can probably get a reputation, uh, probably drawing our attention to more of the heavy-handed elements of God sometimes. And, and, and there's a reason why I do that. Because you live in a culture that doesn't want to hear anything about that. The culture you and I have been raised in wants to hear the message that God approves of us. God approbates us. God likes us. God doesn't require much at all from you. Any kind of adjustment. You're okay. I'm okay. Everybody's okay. God's okay with everybody. And that's what our culture's into. So the idea that the gospel comes to us in protest never gets talked about. And it feels weird and foreign. And it feels like, Keith, you're a jerk for bringing it up. But let's see how you feel about Jesus. The ultimate nice guy, right? Who comes in protest. And he makes his protest very, very clear when he comes. So the Gospel of John is the preserving of Jesus' ministry and life on earth. And this is how it begins. <clears throat> Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. All right, that's, that's welcome to the beginning. There's a creator. He made everything. This is introducing you to the original place and state of existence that came from the creator. But quickly, why Jesus has come is about to get highlighted in the rest of these verses. Verse 5. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. All right, now you're introduced to there is this darkness and light thing happening. That Jesus coming is like the light that splits the darkness and the darkness doesn't win. So there's this adversarial component now. Right, this is where protest comes from. It picks up on the fact that something's not right here. And we get immediately introduced to it. So we're, we're told there's a creator. He's there from the beginning. He made all things. He is light and his light is going to come. And when it comes, it's going to touch darkness. Because we are no longer light. The condition of this world is no longer light. It's no longer enlightened. It's dark now. And light, in a way, protests darkness, doesn't it? When you turn light on, what does it do? It doesn't welcome darkness. It sends darkness fleeing from it. So this is the mission of Christ. To shine light into this darkness. Skip down to verse 9. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. The true light. I find that interesting. That it has to highlight that, it's, that he is the true light. So, what does that imply? That there's false light out there too. So, there's lots of things that masquerade as light, that attempt to do a good impression of light, that you and I interact with. And when Jesus shows up as the true light, he immediately exposes those things and he protests them, if you will. Right? He stands in their midst and he says, not the light, not the light, not the light true light. All right, so this, this, this may not ever have been how Christianity ever feels for you, right? In the modern age, Christianity is not supposed to, it's supposed to be the nice guy on the block. It's never supposed to pick a fight. But you don't get out of chapter one of the gospel of John before light is saying, hey darkness, let's go round one right now. Get in here in the ring with me. And this is Jesus showing up into the world. Verse 10, <clears throat> He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet, this, this is an adversative word. Yet, 
The world did not know him. He came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. All right, can you say massive problem on your hands? Because we just started a few verses earlier with this great revelation that there's this God who's always existed in the beginning. He's always been. And he created. Everything was created by him and for him and for his glory, as you heard last week. And yet, his own creation doesn't know him. And he comes to his own people and they don't receive him. Listen, the first encounter with humanity, with the living God who made us, is not approbative. It's not God showing up saying, everybody's doing a great job. Are we having fun? Is everybody having fun? Isn't this great? Look what I created. Are you, are you loving that? How are you liking taste buds? Aren't those cool? I mean, God doesn't show up this way. He shows up in the world aware that you don't even notice me. I'm standing right in your midst. That's a problem. I've come to protest the fact that you don't even notice that the God who created everything exists. I have a problem with that. This is how God comes here in the Gospel of John. Verse 12. But, right, another little adversative word, hostile to that concept is this. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To become children of God. How many of you thought you were children of God because you were born as a human being? I did. That's what I thought. Everybody's a child of God. What on earth is this talking about? This, this, this is protesting. It is inviting a conversation with you where it says, Keith, I know you always thought that you were always a child of God, but you're not. I'm protesting that concept. You were not always a child of God because you're not a child of God unless you receive and believe the creator. And if you haven't done that, you are not a child of God. That's a protest, isn't it? It's one concept from God picking a fight with something else that I believe and saying one of these is not right. And God's the one who's holding the cards here. Verse 13. People who were born... Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They were born of God. This is the gospel emphasis of our salvation event. Is that we are born of God. There's a new life in us because of what God did. See, salvation is first, foremost, and primarily about what God does to save us. Not about what you and I do in our religious efforts. Although that doesn't mean you and I won't do a whole bunch of things. Because the love of Christ might compel us to lay our lives down and go to the ends of the earth. And sacrifice everything that we have. So we, we probably will do a lot of things with our lives. But the origins of your Christianity, the origins of your rightness with God, is that what God did, not the will of man, not, the, not some birth that can be accomplished by flesh and blood, not human accomplishment or effort. God's got to show up. And when he shows up, he shows up with new birth. And he gives you a new life. And, and, and if you and I don't have a reference point for that, then the gospel comes to you first in protests. Like in John chapter 3. Turn over to John chapter 3. Jesus is going to go door to door. He's going to show up in a man's life named Nicodemus. He is, he is the word of God having, having come in the flesh. Right? He is the creator having become a creature. How many of you guys know that there's a problem when that has to happen? Right? John chapter 1 doesn't begin with God being a creature. It begins with him being transcendent and beyond all things and eternal and unique. But we find out in chapter 1 that the word became flesh and dwelled among us. Listen, you know, when, when, when your principal would walk into your school classroom... Right, principals, 
They do principal stuff, right? They stay in their principal. I used to get called to the principal, so that was very different. But when they showed up in your classroom, you know, everybody was kind of like, like, who's busted? What did they find out? You know, there's this paranoia that swept the room because the principal has left his principal desk. And he's come among us. <laughs> well, there's a problem here. The creator has left his creator dimension, and he's become a creature. And when you look at the inauguration of Jesus' ministry, and he shows up in the very beginning, Matthew chapter 4, the first words out of Jesus' public ministry are, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first words of Jesus, they're not approbative. He doesn't even first come and establish, hey, can we just get clear that I love you? Now, you and I know he loves us. And we know he loves us because the mission that he's on is going to take him all the way to the cross. And he's going to lay his life down to solve the problem that we have. But the first words out of his mouth are protests. Repent. What do you you mean repent? You need to stop believing and being in that condition and start believing and being in this condition. That's a protest. Right? Isaiah says it this way. I think I put this in your outline. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Right? Do you know how many human beings don't receive the thought that their sins are as scarlet they almost feel like, well, I guess that's for some people. I'm, I'm already pretty good with God, you know. Oh, oh, really? You're already as white as snow. Well, not according to the prophet Isaiah, who was speaking of the mission of Jesus Christ. He says, hey, come, let's... This, was, this is Isaiah tacking some things to the door, right? Come, let us reason together, God says. Hey, let's have a conversation about this right here. Theses... In this Isaiah passage is, your sins are as scarlet. That's a protest. That's the gospel coming to you to say, you're you're not all right with God. Your sins are as scarlet. There's a problem here. And in Isaiah, if you go a little further into the book of Isaiah, you'll find Isaiah saying, your sins have made a separation between you and your God so that he does not hear you anymore. That's, That's bad news, isn't it? This is how the gospel comes to us. But this same God who keeps saying he was rejected says, but if you'll receive. The same God who says your sins are as scarlet, but I can make them as white as snow. So he's always holding out this affectionate love and hope to us. But the first thing the gospel has to convince you of is that your skin, sins are as scarlet. Otherwise, you don't need anything that God did in sending his son. You don't need it. One of the great reasons why people just come to church like it's no big deal and it's insignificant is because they don't recognize their own need. I need something to happen to make me right with God. And when that became real to me, suddenly the gospel was very attractive and very important. But as long as I was running around thinking, I'm, I mean, I'm good, I'm not perfect, don't get me wrong, but you know, decent boundaries, decent life, I go to church, I do some things. I'm all right. No, you're just a religious guy whose sins are scarlet. That's who you are, Keith. That's what the gospel comes and says to me. And that's the conversation it wants to have initially. Yeah, you're a nice guy. But your sins are still as scarlet. You could be worse. That's true. I know a lot of people who are worse than you. But your sins are still as scarlet. can Can you say that about yourself? Do you recognize that about yourself? Does that even trouble you? That's one of the things I loved about Martin Luther is when he got a hold of that reality, it drove him nuts. And the fact that it doesn't seem to bother us in our modern age just kind of indicates to me that we don't really think about it. Because if you really thought about it, it would drive you nuts too. And being driven nuts is what will make you search for a solution. And if somebody comes along and says, I can make you white as snow, I'm all ears now. How do you do that? Right? And that's what Christ ultimately came to do. Well, here's where Jesus shows up. And he gets personal with Nicodemus. 
In chapter 3 of the Gospel of John, he says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Remember, that's what we heard in John chapter 1. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? How many of you know that maybe Jesus would say some things to you and me that we don't understand? It doesn't, it doesn't fall in our traditions. It doesn't live in the sweet spot of what we believed all of our lives growing up. That's Nicodemus. Right? What is Nicodemus' condition? You know, he doesn't stumble in after a tough night out and he's a drug dealer and he's got track marks up and down his arm and he stumbles into a meeting with Jesus. Dude, man, you got to be from God. Totally. Totally into it, man. Uh, Nicodemus is a respected man in the community. Nicodemus is well-dressed. He is a religious leader. He is a teacher of the people of Israel. The people of Israel, right? The people who walk around referencing the Old Testament. The people who get that there's one God who created everything. They get a lot right. And they've got their traditions and their practices and they're walking in them. And Nicodemus is a decent guy. Maybe I grow up to be a Nicodemus in 1978. And I've got my religious practices and the gospel comes to me at some point later in my life and it has a conversation with me that starts like this. Keith, you must be born again. Protest. Your current condition will not land you in the kingdom of heaven. That's what is being said here. To a decent man. To a man who's helping other people to put on some aspect of religion as well. And yet Jesus marvels. You're a teacher of these things and you've missed the main point. Do you think that might could be true of any of us? That we grew up with something and Jesus comes along in protest and says, hey, what you've known your whole life is off and lacking. And if this doesn't happen in your life, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Flip over to John chapter 8. And here Jesus is going to protest the religious crowds. Again, these are religious people. So these are not people with no moral boundaries or no desires toward God. These are not Roman pagans who worship their ancestors. And these are not Greeks who worship Greek gods and Greek mythology. This is not who this is. These are people who have reference points to Abraham. They're going to point back to Abraham. They're going to argue with Jesus that we are descendants of Abraham. We believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We, we, we follow the teachings of Moses. We have great respect for King David. These guys are using, they're dropping names all over the place that matter. And Jesus is going to speak to them and say these words. John 8 verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And they knew exactly what he was saying. Well, not exactly, but they knew that th this doesn't bode well. What, what are you saying about us? They answered him, well, we're offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become 
free. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This, This is a protest moment. Jesus shows up in the lives of these people. They're convinced that they're free. They're convinced, hey, I'm good. We're free. We're free people. And whatever sense we understand freedom of our own will, of our own course in life, of our destiny, we are those people. We are free. And Jesus comes up and says, protest. No, you're not. You're not free. And the only way for you to be free is through me. I'm the only one who can make you free. And anyone who commits sin, so then he just gathered everybody in the room, is a slave to sin. Do you see yourself that way? Oh man, hey. Typically, I'm, I mean, listen, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm I'm not perfect by any means. Everybody screws up every once in a while, right? I mean, that's me too. But, you know, I'm I'm no Adolf Hitler, Charles Manson or something. I think I'm a decent guy. I I mean, I try, I try to do the right thing. I try to do right by people, you know, that's what I was taught. My dad taught me that, you know, this is the kind of conversation you have with people, right? And then you stand up and say, oh, well, did, did you know you're a slave to sin? <laughs> what? What do you mean I'm a slave to sin? I mean, I, right? Foreign thought. Jesus shows up and the first thing he says is, you know what? You got your concepts wrong. You, your ideas have drifted from what God has said are the real ideas that describe life. No, no, no. You really are a slave to sin. And you're going to live shackled to that for the rest of your life. And I'm the only one with the key who can unlock that shackle for you. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. But if I don't set you free, you will never set yourself free. And there's no human being, there's no idea, there's no power source out there that can set you free from sin. I'm the only one. That's a protest. It calls for a response. And then Jesus turns to his crowd in verse 39 and they answered him, Abraham is our father. Now they're going to defend These things you're saying about us, they're not true. We're good religious people, Jesus. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works of your father. They said to him, we are not born of sexual immorality. We, are, we have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from him and I am here. If God were your father. Right, this, is, this is radical news. They're claiming God is our father. And Jesus is turning around and saying, No, he's not. This is crazy, isn't it? This is how the gospel comes to us. It comes and explains to us our condition and our need. You are, you're decent, you're moral, and you're going through religious motions. All right, pick that up from the first century in these Jews and set it down in the city of New Orleans in 2017. You're decent, you're moral, and you're going through religious traditions. And Jesus could come to you and he could break this news to you. Your your father's not God. You're not related to him. You can be offended. They were offended, right? I mean, at some point, they want to take up rocks and stone Jesus over the same conversation in another place. So they're not happy with this deal. And he, and he gets a little bit more specific as this passage moves on. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Right? That, that's what we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right? where we started. There's, a, there's something that goes off on the inside of you that the love of God compels us and controls us. 
And we begin to be new creatures who are in agreement with God and the old has passed away and new has come. See, this is what Jesus is describing. You know, you would be affectionately following God from the inside out. You wouldn't just be walking after some rules on the outside. That's not what makes you a child of Abraham. What makes you a child of Abraham is the birth that God brings. And I don't see that in you. Verse 43. Why do you not understand what I say? Well, it's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. Well, this is getting worse, isn't it? (laughs) And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he's a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Don't you love this conversation with the gospel? I, I needed to hear that. I needed a knock on the door in February of 1979 to be clear that the gospel was saying, Keith, you are not of God. And that was radical and crazy. And I couldn't believe it. It was foreign. It was different than what I had been raised to believe. But that's what these guys were saying too. This could be a very common experience, could it not? That the Bible comes to us, the gospel comes to us in protest. Has, has it come to you that way? Right, in 1517, Martin Luther, remember I mentioned I'm going to go back and teach all this stuff, but Martin Luther had spent time studying the Bible in the years leading up to 1517, which would have not have been what he had done earlier in his life. He would have studied philosophy, would have studied a lot of things, but he studied the Bible and sovereignly made the mistake of studying the books of Hebrews, Galatians, and Romans, all back to back, and then the Psalms on either side of those. Hebrews, Galatians, and Romans. Now, if you, if you want to get clarity on the gospel, study the book of Hebrews, Galatians, and Romans. And he got clarity. And what those books did is they pulled up into a conversation, pulled a chair up next to Martin Luther and said, "Uh, Martin, you are not right with God. And one verse after another after another in those letters in Scripture protested his condition. So much so that he got to a place where he recognized the church teachings have drifted. We have drifted. And he nailed those ideas to the door and said, come let us reason together. But he did that under protest. Now listen, you are here this morning. And my prayer for this service is that you would let protests come to your doorstep this morning. You would embrace the thought that maybe the gospel is at odds with you. Maybe it's saying some things that you have got to ponder differently and not hide behind your descendant of Abraham. I've always been a part of this family. I've always been a decent, moral, religious person. That's everybody in the gospel of John. That Jesus turns to have a conversation with them and says, you're still not right. You have to be born again. This salvation's got to come from the inside out. It's a revolutionary thing. You're going to know this took place. There's going to be new desires in your heart. You're going to want to abandon old things and adopt new things. Has that happened for you? Do you have that in your background? The love of Christ becomes compelling and constraining on the inside. Affection for God begins to ooze out of your life. Listen, do you you stand, and you're going to hear about singing in a couple of weeks. Do you stand in this room when we have a chance to sing to God, disaffectioned from Him? Do you find yourself easier to sing at some U2 concert or something? 
That's an affection issue. Does somebody have to tell you to have affection? No, affection comes from the inside out. Right? I'm, I'm, there are lots of things I have affection for, right? I'm going to have affection this afternoon when the Saints score a touchdown. I'm going to have affection for that. You know, I won't have to have anybody in my family come over and, and say, hey, Keith, can you, you know, get up off the sofa, clap, cheer, do something that's exciting, touchdown. Oh, yeah. But I don't have to eat food that's really awesome and have somebody go, mm hmm, good, mm hmm. Right? I mean, affection just comes from the inside, it's, it's a reality that's there. If your Christianity doesn't have that reality in it, there's no affection for God. There's no love for him. You don't know anything about being an ambassador for him because you haven't gotten close enough to his heart to be compelled to go represent him in this world. Because his heart is to the ends of the earth seeking those who are lost. Is that in you? If it's not in you, and you might just be a religious person going through the motions. If you can't find this stuff on the inside of you. And what I'm praying for this morning is today will change all that for you. Because the really, really awesome good news is the Jesus who shows up, the creator who puts his feet on the earth and says, you know, I came to my own and my own didn't even know me. Didn't recognize me didn't worship, didn't bow down, didn't respect. But to as many as did believe, to those who receive, they receive the power to become children of God. That power is still, that power is in this room this morning. And it's available. Let's bow our hearts together for a moment. I want you just to ponder for a moment your, what's going on on the inside? What's your story? Does it sound like the gospel story? Does it sound like 2 Corinthians chapter 5? Do you identify with Nicodemus' need for something he didn't have, even though it's mysterious? Are you here this morning recognizing and accepting, and be honest, recognizing and accepting that the gospel comes to you personally in protest of your life and its condition? Have you ever tasted that? Do you know what it is to experience the discomfort of truly knowing I fall short of the glory of God. I stand in need. Do you believe that about yourself? Do you recognize that salvation is the coming of God's life to you? It's the Holy Spirit coming to take up his life in you. It's not just self-determination to polish up religious practices and do them better or live a more narrow moral life. It is the life of God coming into you and making you a person you weren't just moments ago and beginning a work that goes from the inside out that brings with it affection and worship of God. It brings with it an ambassadorship that you understand there is this mandate on your life to take the gospel to others. And you are compelled to do that. Listen, if you're here this morning and what I'm describing is foreign to you, you, you don't know what it is to have an inner compelling presence of God, then if nothing else you're going to be doing right now, tell God you don't want that anymore. 
Because that's not what the Bible sounds like. You want what the Bible sounds like. Tell God that. The Bible calls that being born again. And if that's not in your story, it can be your story right now. We come by faith, believing what God has said. Well, we have read what God has said. And this morning, God opens his arms to you and he says, come. Come to me. Any who would believe and receive, I give you the power to become children of God. If, if that's what you want, then come to God this morning. Open your heart to him. Receive his life into your life. Because if you're here this morning and you want to do that and you're recognizing, I need to do that. I don't just want to do it. I need to do it. Just some of you see your hand. Slip your hand up for me real quickly. And you're saying, yeah, I need to do that. Thank you. Hold up for Hey, man, mean something to God this morning. Say, hey, God, I, I need you. And I have not felt that life surging from inside of me. I lack love for you and affection for you. I am not eager to take your gospel to others. There's something missing in me, God. There's something missing. So if you're here this morning and you've not had that kind of relationship with God right now, slip your hand up and just say, hey, God, I want to receive that from you. Slip your hand up for me real quick. I want to receive that, God. I want to receive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if that's where you are this morning, I'm going to pray as though I'm praying this prayer for the first time. And I prayed some kind of a prayer like this in 1979. And you can pray the words that I pray, or you can put them in your own words. What's most important is that your heart right now is recognizing your need and open to receive. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I fall short of your glory and your perfection and your purpose. I'm part of a world gone wayward. I'm part of a human race detached from you. You, the creator. This morning I recognize in me is need. My life needs you. And I also recognize my need to be right with you. So I come to you by faith with my need. And by faith I receive from you. I receive a life that I don't have apart from you. I receive your Holy Spirit into my life. I answer the call to repent, to turn from life on my terms, my way for my glory and I give it to you to be lived for you. God, that's my act of worship. Ultimately, my life is for you. And I give it to you this morning. The only one who's worthy. You are worthy of my life, not me. Give to me your heart. A heart that loves the way you love. A heart of affection. For you, a heart of worship. For all that is glorious about you. A willingness to take your gospel even to the ends of the earth to learn your gospel to proclaim your gospel to be an ambassador for you Lord I pray my life 
would simply be the expression of your life now dwelling and living in me. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, listen, if salvation is a work of God, it's what God does more than what you do. In some ways, I had no idea what atomic bomb I had welcomed inside of me in February of 1979. I just knew I needed God, my life felt empty. And that I wasn't good enough for my own salvation. And that's how I came to God. But the Spirit of God came and an explosion went off and suddenly desires changed. Sin patterns changed. My life changed. My devotion and love for God and people, it just began to change. Not because I scripted that and got up and made myself do it. There was new desires that were inside of me. And if you prayed that this morning, That's where you are. Pay attention to the inside where the Spirit now dwells and see what is coming out of you, what desires are in you. Be launched into this new life that God has that started when the gospel came to you in protest. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Y'all have a great, awesome week this week.